about. So it was noted uh, several years ago that patients with fetal, high levels of fetal hemoglobin. So when we are all born, we have, we have what, what is called, hemoglobin is a protein inside of the red cell. It's different when we're born. When we're born, we, it's called fetal hemoglobin. And as in the first six months of life, it changes. And as the fetal hemoglobin comes down in, in the first six months, the adult hemoglobin goes up. So if you have hemoglobin A, normal hemoglobin, you have within six months, you, you develop your adult hemoglobin, is fetal hemoglobin. If you have sickle cell disease, your adult hemoglobin is sickle cell hemoglobin. So in the first six months of life, that also explains why kids don't get in trouble in any way because you may have fevers, and we, we talk a lot about fevers and managing fevers, but in terms of crisis, you know, there's no pain in, in the first six months, usually. Uh, um, at about six months, then you start having changes with, um, with painful bones, as in fetal hemoglobin level goes down. So in years ago, a big study was done in the U.S. where they looked at over 3,000 patients with sickle cell disease across the U.S., and they, they looked at many different aspects of those, those uh, patients, and it was noted that people who have higher fetal hemoglobin levels, some people hold on to their fetal, fetal hemoglobin levels, they tend to be less, less sick. So with, with that, some bright person came up with the idea, of what, if, what if you could increase uh, a patient with sickle cell disease, fetal hemoglobin, by another means, if it's not done naturally, and, and this was shown that there's a few drugs that they could use this in, in, um, in an animal model and it worked. So out of that came a number of drugs that were tried early. Some had significant side effects and were thrown up, you know, put aside. And hydroxyurea was one which could be, was found to be safe and was used, it could be given by mouth, not even, some of the others needed injection. And so it, hydroxyurea was identified as being safe and, and easy to use, and, and then the big trials were starting. Not completely known how it works, but we know that it works on, on developing red cells, and the faster dividing red cells are the sickle cells, it works on those at, in, at, the, very, at the developing cell stage. So you, you inducing um, fetal hemoglobin. At this stage, you also, it does a number of other things, which I'll show you. I start with a with one of our patients who is a sep just to illustrate the, use, the benefit of hydroxyurea. This is a seven-year-old boy who had come to Canada four years before coming to see us, and over the previous four years he had several admissions to hospital with pain, and and these admissions were uh, a week or more in, in duration. Um, he saw us in ja in in January of 2008. I'm sorry, June of 2008, and at that time. One of the things, so we can measure hospital ad admissions as a hard number of an indication of being unwell. But a lot of our patients, you all know, don't come into hospital. They stay home, they manage the pain, you use your home, home remedies, and some of the measures we, we, we suggest that you do. And you, you get by the crisis without actually coming into hospital. So using a hospital hospitalization as, a, as, as how severe a disease can be, you might miss a lot of people. So this little boy had had several admissions every year, but in, even in the first six months of school, January to June, his school report had 30 days missed from school. And when, you, when, you, when the kids come in, I often ask the parents on the last school report how many days did they miss from school, because that's a pretty good indication of, of illness, not just coming in the hospital, which I can go in the hospital record and see, but those other times that they're missing school because they have my less severe pain not bringing in the hospital. So at that point, we started hydroxyurea in 2008, and, and these, are, these are his actual figures. So it, we know the benefits, it increases fetal hemoglobin, and if you look at, at, at this graph, at the bottom on the left, his fetal hemoglobin started off at about 2%, and over two years, he was up to, this is about 25%. So this was an amazing response. And we know that people who start with a little bit fetal hemoglobin, a little higher than usual, they have the greatest response. The ones who start at about what we'd expect for non sickle patients, um, uh, about 1%, they can have not as great a response. So he went up amazing, and with that, um, there's also a clinical response. 
the, the next thing we, we know that it lowers, so it's a hydroxyurea suppresses the bone marrow, which is a factory for blood cells. So it lowers the white cell count and the white cells, which are called neutrophils, which these are the ones that fight bacteria. The neutrophils also produce substances which cause inflammation within the blood vessels. And when you have a crisis, it's not just a blocking of the blood vessel, you also have inflammation in, in there, which adds to the further blockage and, 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 and less oxygen delivered. So we know it decreases the neutrophil count. And, and, we, and that's why whenever you start hydroxyurea, we're very strict on getting blood work done on the outside and having it faxed into us every two weeks because we want to decrease the neutrophil count. We don't want to reduce it so low that you start getting infections because you can't fight. But we want to reduce it to get rid of the effect that it has on crisis. So once you start, we get you to do blood work every two weeks for quite a while, and then until you're in a stable, steady state. And I see some moms are smiling because, and if they don't get the blood work done, then you get a call from Marcia usually. Where's the blood work? Because once we commit to treating you, we want you to commit to doing the blood work because we have to be safe to keep the patient safe. It drops the reticulocyte counts. The ret reticulocyte counts are retics you, you might be familiar with. These are young red cells. So if you if it, if you decrease in the amount of breakdown of blood cells, the, the hemoglobin, the blood cells will remain longer and you have to make fewer numbers of reticulocyte counts. And again, on the left one, this, for this young man, he's, he, most of our patients have very high reticulocyte counts and he drops significantly with his reticulocyte count over two years. Which is which is what you want to see. This, 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 these slides are actually this is a perfect response. He, you also drop he drops his neutrophil counts. You don't want them too low, so the lower margin is a 2.0. So he's just above 2.0 now, and that's what we want to see. Keep them relatively significantly lower, but not low enough to cause infection. It decreases the stickiness and improves the flow of blood cells. And one of the ways it does that is it changes the formation of the red blood cells themselves so they can flow more easily through blood vessels. And one of the things that we see very early, even a month on treatment, is that the blood cells get a bit fatter. The diameter goes up. And on this slide here, you, you have that. Once he started, his his MCV, or you, some of you would be familiar, this, the diameter of the red cells goes up significantly. And this is one of the things that we know if you're taking it or not. So if you come to clinic and the MCV <laughs> hasn't started moving up, and you say you take, you give it to your child, or the child says they're taking it, and we don't see that, then we say something's not right here. Maybe you're not taking it properly, maybe you're not taking it at all, maybe you're giving it to this child, and the child's taking it sometimes, it happens, in the privacy of a bathroom and instead of in front of you, you gotta watch them swallow it. It also reduces the breakdown of red cells because you now have cells which are less, less easily fragmented, is less cyclin, and with um, the, one of the um, tests that we do is a bilirubin test, and on the, the slide on the right shows this patient's bilirubin has gone right down. Bilirubin you would be more familiar with, it stains the eyes yellow, so you have some patients after starting, um, the bilirubin is a product of breakdown of red cells. So after you start hydroxyurea, and you have less breakdown of red cells, you produce less bilirubin. So the eyes become less yellow. And in this young man, we definitely saw this, that his <laughs> bilirubin was way down. It also, nitric oxide, we know with any, any break, breakdown red cell, red cell breakdown disorder, like uh, sickle cell thalassemia, Parasitosis. Any of those, when you break down red cells, you you pr produce, you release the hemoglobin from within the cell. It comes out into the circulation, and that mops up a substance called nitric oxide, which we need to help um, with all. When when we don't have enough nitric oxide, our blood vessels don't dilate as as much. And by giving hydroxyurea, one of the breakdown products is nitric oxide, so it also increases. Oxide, which is a good thing. So this is this also this young man's blood cells. So you can actually see what happens. So we know that um, I, I don't have it here written, but by the end of two years, he had no more admissions in hospital on, since, since starting hydroxyurea. On the left here, you have his blood smear. This is his actual blood smear. 
you can see sickle cells here and down here. All of these uh, slim, it, they're not as classic sickle as in the pictures, but that's, it depends on how you get them when this slide is made. Um, so you have a lot of sickle cells. You have blood cells that have slightly different shapes. This is a year into treatment, and you have few of those sickle cells. And this is two years into treatment on the extreme right, and you have I, you have no sickle cells being seen here. And you could probably somebody might not know. I don't, there's nothing on this slide that makes me say that you could prove that this person has sickle cell disease. So you, you, you completely reduce the sickle cell, and you can completely reduce. If he got, for example, an intercurrent illness like a cough or cold, mm -hmm. a really bad infection, then you could still sickle. But generally, it's over two years, there's no further sickling, and the blood, blood film becomes pretty normal, which is a, an excellent response. In, in encouraging patients when they're, when they're on, we, we don't have facilities right now to show, the, show you your actual blood cells, but when you come to clinic, you can actually see those graphs. And if I don't, I don't bring it up because sometimes we get really hectic in the clinic, you ask to see those graphs and you can see what your child is doing. Now just to talk, any, any questions before you, we move on? Don't, don't be shy, nobody. What age can we start? Pardon? What age can we start? What age? So any any age. Our youngest patient that we started was about a year and a half. In um, they've been I'll, I'll review, review some of these. There are studies in patients who from birth were put on hydroxyurea, and it was shown to be quite safe. And there's some benefits. I'll show you, I'll show you that. You can start at any age. We because generally we we all we try to balance risks and benefits. So if you have a little child who is perfectly well, we wouldn't start a medication. But if they're coming into hospital frequently, then you know, at any age we would we would ask we would suggest that you go on child go on hydroxyurea. One of our parents said, well, "Why don't you just put everybody as soon as they're born on hydroxyurea?" And that's been an argument that people have used, and there probably will come a time when people will say that that is the right thing to do. But um, at this point in time, we don't put anybody on just because you have sickle cell disease. You sort of earn it a bit by being sick, and then you go on, and, and it makes us we feel more comfortable um, if you've been sick. And a lot of parents don't want their child on something just because they have a diagnosis, you know, if, it, if it's not totally indicated. And so the risk would be, what are the risks? The risk of? of being on hydroxyurea, because you don't put them on when they're born. So what are the risks? Like, what are the, I mean, I know they're taking something, injecting something, but is there? So the, the risks are, are some of these. The drop in the white count. Mm -hmm. So every, every time you, you start using any medication, you should balance, you should think of risks and benefits. And you only take the, the medication if the benefits outweigh the risks. So the risks are dropping the blood count. How do we do that? We monitor the white count. And if, you, and if the white count goes down, we're happy when it goes down. If it goes down too low, then, then we want to hold the drug for a little, and we may reduce the dose a little. So, so, so dropping the white blood count, can you can you break it down? Like if the white blood count is dropped, uh, what does that mean? So, is it, so, is so when you when you drop your white cell count, your the neutrophil count of those white cells which fight bacterial infections. Okay, so you're more so, prone to. So you're more prone to infection if you don't monitor it carefully. Mm -hmm. So what, that's why we get blood counts done every two weeks, because we, we have a threshold below which we will hold the drug. So we don't allow you to get to a low enough level that you start getting serious infections. That's why the monitoring of the drug. And that's why we, we, we insist on getting blood work done every two weeks, especially in the, in the early phases of until we establish a, a steady state drug level, um, drug uh, dosage. Because if you, if, you, if you don't do that, then you run the risk. But I, I wouldn't like anybody to go away thinking that by putting your child on hydroxyurea, putting them at risk of infection, you will if you don't monitor. Because then you don't, you, you don't know where, you, where your white cells are, for example. Yes, uh, Bill is talking on uh, Sorry, just one second. If you ask me a question, we want everybody to be able to hear that question. If you don't mind to have them stand up and, oh. and speak a little bit louder. Sorry, there's no mic, but we want people to still hear. Thanks. Yeah, Joseph. 
has been on this medication for the longest while. And uh, at one point, she was hospital free for about a year and a half or two, which was great. But since of late, it just tend to just clear up somewhat. So I'm just wondering if it's probably not taking the medication the way it should, or just other stuff that made us clear up. <laughs> So when, like any, any drug in, in children, as children grow, they get bigger, they can outgrow your dose. So we've actually seen this during puberty. If you don't keep up with the dose, then, then you outgrow your dose, you start getting into crisis. So for, to answer your question, we should look at whether the dose is appropriate for his weight. If we just haven't gone up on the dose recently, and we have to make sure that Joseph is actually swallowing the pills, but I know he is, right? I know that <laughs> religiously every day. It doesn't work if you it, it wouldn't get you wouldn't get the benefit if you take it when you have pain only. It's not a pain medicine. It has to work on developing cells, so you have to take it constantly to prevent the cells from from sickness. Probably kind of related, but not related. Um, so with sickle cell, um, my son has sickle cell anemia, and when we lived in England, we took um, antibiotics up until I think the age of, I don't remember now. Five. Is it five? When we went to North America, we were told it's not given after that age. So my question, and sort of related to this, you mentioned earlier that um, if a sickle cell patient is on hydroxyurea, that they're prone to infection, but you do monitor that anyway. I'll go back a little. Okay. I don't want anybody leaving thinking when you're on hydroxyurea, you're prone to infection. You're not. Hydroxyurea drops the blood cell, the white cells, and that's part of the way that it works. By decreasing the white cell count, you decrease some of the inflammatory response that you get in a crisis. We want the blood cells to go down, the white cells to go down, and that's one of the ways we think it works. But we have a threshold below which we would back off on the dose. So if you get lower than that, if you get very low white cells and you're not, monitor, not being monitored, then you could be at risk for infections because white cells fight infections. But I would never want anybody to think hydroxyurea puts you at risk for infections. We want, that's why we <coughs> monitor it, to make, to make sure you're not getting to that level that you are at risk for infections. Does that answer it? Okay, sorry. My question is, um, um, a patient asked me this before. Um, this person is on hydroxyurea, but they're wondering if they stop a bit, just to make sure their body, their body gets a rest from the drug and they go back on it. They ask if that would be a better idea than just be on continuous hydroxyurea, you so, know. So they, they, it's, 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 it's up to the patient. So what we're, in the early days, I used to, after three, four years, I used to say, do you want to take a break from hydroxyurea? And the few patients that took a break, they immediately go back in hospital often, uh, again. So sickle cell disease, you get sick, you all know this, you get sick, you have bad times, and then you have great times. When you have no crisis, then you have bad times again. So when you start hydroxyurea, after, it's usually after you've been sick a lot, and then you get better, then people say, I want to stop because I'm not sick anymore. And, and you stop and then you get sick again. And then you go back on. It, it hasn't been shown that there's any negative effect of being on long term. And I think if we can get through, we can actually talk to somebody who's been on it for several years. Um, who's going to call in in a little while. Um, so there's, there's, no, there's no downside to staying on it. And actually, I'll show you some positive things about being on it long term. 